Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our first session um, looking at movement and movement games for everyone. Um, can we first of all thank the Abu Dhabi Early Childhood Authority for making these um, sessions possible? So without further ado, we've got lots to get through in our sessions. What I'd like you to first of all think about is why is movement important? And I know you were asked this question before the webinar, but just to take a minute or so to reflect on that. When I was a child, we didn't really worry too much about how much movement children did um, because I spent a huge amount of my childhood outside playing. Um, I came home either when I was hungry or when it was dark. So lifestyles were very different then than they are now. And it might be worth reflecting on the kind of movement opportunities you had compared to the movement opportunities your children have now. And also reflecting sometimes on whether those movement opportunities that children have are organized structured activities. So they might go to golf or to swimming or to football, but how many opportunities do they have just to play, just to get out with equipment things that they want to be want um, pieces of equipment to be their imagination and just do things so it's worth thinking about you know why that's important and how things have actually changed there has been a significant increase in childhood obesity um, now i've got some figures here to show you and these link to the chief medical officers guidelines in the uk and I'm just going to talk you through these to have a, a little idea of the kind of ways things are changing now. Um, the chief medical officer guidelines in the UK are that children should do at least 60 minutes of physical activity a day. For younger children, for under five, that's actually um, three hours a day. And we'll see, hopefully, as we go on, why this is so important. Um, why there's actually more hours or more time allocated to younger children than there is to older children. At present in the UK, only 17.5% of children are actually achieving that. Um, one of the big things for me is we have a real push here about um, the, the increase in obesity um, levels and we see a lot in the media about what children are eating and how they're not doing as enough activity and they are becoming obese. But actually, if you look at the last statistic on this page, um, physical inactivity is actually a bigger risk factor um, for all of us than being obese. Um, so we need to be thinking very carefully about how much physical activity they do. I'd just like you to have a look at a video um, and just have a listen to this video and then I'm going to give you a minute just to think about and reflect on this video afterwards. Thank you. I'll just stop this share. I probably would make a time machine. I would make medicine for the sick. I'd probably invent something new. If I could have an extra five years to live. You said five, right? Five years. It's a long time. I would try to fix everything I did bad. I would bring my uncle back because I miss him very much. I would um, get a, more hamsters. I would probably want to go looking for dark matter. I think I'd go looking for aliens. If I could live an extra five years. I was thinking about making like a, a helicopter, like a wooden helicopter. But I don't have any wood. I want to go check out the moon sometime. 
I'd probably teach my sister not to hate tuna. I would try and invent a machine that lets you that lets you run at light speed. If I had five more extra years to live, I would be the boss of all the chipmunks. Eu cantaria na frente de um milhão de pessoas. I don't really know. I think I'd do anything. Why are you asking me that? Okay, what I'd like you to do now is just to reflect on that. Um, it is a very scary statistic. Um, if you would like to just put a comment or a question in the chat box, I'm going to give you a minute to do that. Um, I would encourage you to put comments, questions in the chat box, um, and then this it makes it a much more interactive session and we can make sure that we're actually talking about what you want to learn. Okay, then, if no one has any um, questions or comments, um, that it, it is, as I said, quite scary. But the important thing for us as parents and as carers is that actually the opportunity to do something about this is in our hands. So it's thinking about how we can really encourage children to be more physically active. And I think one of the important things of today's session is to actually understand why that is so important, not just from a physical activity and obesity um, or inactivity point of view, but also from a learning point of view. If you think about it, from the moment children are born, they interact with our world through movement. They find out how long they are by stretching out their legs, how wide they are by stretching out their arms. And early movement is the foundation on which all the higher abilities of reading, writing and maths are built. At birth, the connections to higher centers are only tenuously made, but the movement experience that a child has will play a pivotal role in shaping their personality, their feelings and their achievements, both in a physical and an academic arena. So if we look at this slide, the more a child moves, the more a child knows. They find out about their environment by moving around and finding out about it. If you think about it, when you have um, babies, once they start being able to crawl, they're into everything. They're exploring things, they're putting things in their mouths, and they find out about their environment through moving through it. But then the more they know, the more they want to know. And as they eventually build up that stability and they start cruising around the furniture, and this is when you know you're in trouble because they're going to be into absolutely everything. But then the more they want to know, the more they need to move. So everything they want to find out about as a child comes from movement. If we think about all of the connections in a child's brain, when they're first born, they have lots of brain cells, but very few connections between one brain cell to the other. The more connections they can make in early childhood, the better it is for them. And movement actually facilitates that wiring of the brain. So one of the things, if we want that good brain development, we have to give them lots of experiences, lots of movement opportunities to develop a movement vocabulary. One of the really important things is that the body is so important and movement is so important to the brain that if the brain actually um, 
concentrates in the first few years on getting that movement right and actually um, allowing children to move automatically. For example, when we are walking down the street, do you ever think about how you're walking? And you probably haven't done that for a long time since you were maybe around one. So the brain needs movement to become automatic so that it can then concentrate all its power, its learning power on higher skills and reasoning. So we need children to develop automaticity. In other words, they don't have to think about how they're controlling their body. Um, it's just something that happens automatically without them thinking about it. If you think, and we'll talk about this later on, if you think about a child who's, who hasn't got very good stability, when they're sitting in class and they're sitting on a chair, they're spending all their time trying to keep themselves stable and actually not able to concentrate and listen to what the teacher is saying. So actually they develop this automaticity through a variety of different physical ex experiences and lots of repetition. If we want children to learn, they have to do things over and over and over again. It's not enough that they once hit a ball with a tennis racket. They need to have lots and lots of practice so they know that every time they go to hit a ball with a tennis racket, they'll be able to do it. So thinking all the time about practice makes permanent and giving children lots and lots of opportunities to do that. Um, the development of movement happens step by step. There's a clear um, progression through that movement, but each child has their own unique timetable. Sometimes as parents, it's very difficult not to compare our child to other children um, to their own siblings or to other families and think, oh, my child's not doing that, my child's not doing this. Um, but children do have that unique timetable and they develop through those um, developmental steps at the same way, but at different rates. If we have um, a daily routine with lots of movement in it, it should be enough to allow the children to have that basic physical development. With some children, they may need, may need a little bit of intervention to do that. But again, it's still about lots of practice, finding out what the children need help with and giving them lots of practice doing that. If we look at this one, the importance of movement to cognitive development, if we look at the picture on the right hand side, um, and if you think about when you first had children or your children were babies, the first thing they learn to do is lift their heads. And from learning to lift their heads, they then learn to lift their shoulders. They then learn to have a strong core to be able to sit up. Eventually, they learn to have enough stability and balance to be able to stand up. So they develop their motor skills from the top down. The other important thing for us, and this especially when they get to school, is if we move on to the other diagram, they develop their motor skills from the inside out. So if we think about um, fine motor skills, I'm just going to come out of this share. If you think about fine motor skills, they are in the extremities of our body. So if we are learning our motor skills from the inside, to the outside, we need to make sure that we have strong muscles, strong big muscles. The large muscles are the ones that um, start working first. So we need that strong core, which then moves out to our um, extremities and our fine motor skills. Now, when we're in school, um, there's a lot of um, focus put on fine motor skills, on being able to write, on being able to fasten buttons and zips but we need to have the strong gross motor skills first. And sometimes rather than doing more and more handwriting practice, we actually need to do some big heavy movement that uses the large muscles of our body to actually help children develop those. And that we're going to do a lot of those this morning so you can see what they are. I'm just gonna have a look and quick look in the chat box. Okay, we will be talking about those. We're about to have a look at um, lots of um, different activities now. 
So if we're talking about building up gross motor skills, we need to be looking at activities that will um, develop those large muscles. You do have a handout that you will receive after um, this session. So I thought that during the session, it would be worth us looking at some other uh, activities. So you might want to jot some of them down or just remember some of the um, different activities that we might do. One of the activities that is nice for younger children is actually moving like animals. And what I'd like you to think about here is that often we think that th this is just a game, but for children, once you start thinking about, are they developing shoulder strength? Are they developing core stability? All of a sudden, from a parental point of view, you can see all of the different things that they're developing from these um, activities that aren't just about them having fun and playing as anim like animals. There are lots of books. Um, you can use things like, um, there's a lovely book called Giraffes Can't Dance. Um, things like Commotion in the Ocean, Bumpus, Jumpus, Dinosaur, Rumpus. Lots of books that are just books for children to read. They're not physical activity books, they're just fun reading books. But you as a parent can actually turn those books into a little bit of an active story and get the children to be looking at um, the different movements for the animals. So let's have a look at some of these movements that you might be able to do with your children. So let's start off with a caterpillar. Now anyone who goes to the gym um, will know this as a walking plank. So a caterpillar walks out onto their, into a plank position and then walks their feet in. So the bottoms are going high and then their arms go back out again. So you might want to have a quick try at that one at home. So you walk out with your hands and walk in with your feet. The question in the chat box asked about um, an activity for nine-year-olds. Now, nine-year-old children can do that and be walking, but they might prefer to call it a walking plant rather than a caterpillar. Um, I think it's around getting them to do the activity, but how you introduce it will be something that will interest your children. Um, another one, a seal walk. This one's actually quite hard to do. Same position in a plank, but in this one, you turn your feet so that the front of your feet are on the floor and you move along and you drag yourself along the floor on your feet. You need a lot of strong um, core muscles to be able to do that. So this again, there's a three-year-old one in there. The caterpillar is fine for the three-year-old. All of these activities that I'm showing you will be suitable for a variety of different ages. And we'll, I'll show you how you can make them a little bit more complicated as we go on. Um, things like a bear walk, again, feet apart, bending forwards, and moving feet to the side with a bit of balance. Lots of children can do those. Another one we might look at, um, a snake charmer. And this is um, quite a nice one for children because they get to um, make the hissing snake noise at the end and a lot of them like it. So the idea is they lie on the floor with their knees bent and when they hear the snake charmer music, which might have to, unfortunately for now is me singing, but you might be able to play it on an instrument. Um, as they hear that music, they have to wiggle back up to sitting. So let's have a go. So down, onto your tummy, onto your back, and then and then they rock back down gently so core muscles all the time and then do 
Yes. If you wanted to make it a little more difficult, if you have an older child, you could actually ask them to put their hands up above the head like a snake. So let's try it like that. So hands up. Do, 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 do. A lot harder for the tummy muscles. Um, another activity that I like, and I've forgotten my little teddy bear this morning. Um, this one is a good one for children of a variety of different ages. So let's imagine that my ball is my teddy bear as I've left it outside. So we put the ball on the floor and the children are on their hands and knees. So if that's a teddy bear and you ask a younger child, can they wave a hand to the teddy bear? Can they wave the other hand to a teddy bear? Can they wave their knee to a teddy bear? Can they wave their other knee? As they get better at this, you might ask them to do one hand, one knee. So they're going across and the other way. When we've got children who are getting stronger, and I don't like to say older, because like I said earlier on, this is about stage, not age. So I don't want to put a label on and say, this is what a five-year-old should be doing, because some three-year-olds might be doing that, some seven-year-olds might still be struggling. So it's just activities that you can do that suit your children, and you know your children best. So this one can become more complicated. So let's look at, this time, same activity going into a plank. So it might be, can you lift your hand up? Can you lift the other hand up? Can you lift a foot off? Can you maybe put that foot on the other one so you're balancing on one foot? Another one might be, can you lift, I'm gonna do it with a bean bag, that one slide. So can you pick up, a bean. Now I have a bean bag, this could be a paper plate, it could be a toy, anything. Can you pick it up, put it on your back, put your hand down, pick it up, put it back on the other hand. Again, increasing in difficulty. You can do it the other way around as well. So you can do it with their tummies up to the ceiling. So if their tummies up, can they wave a foot? Can they wave the other foot? Can they wave a hand? or the other hand. Again, you can then, from that, you can make it into a, what is called a front support position. So it's that position. And again, lifting up feet, lifting up hands. Whoa, I find that one hard, but some children don't. And like we said earlier on, it's about practice. The more practice children get, the better they are at things. So we might look at something as an adult and say, oh, that's really hard, I can't do it. But actually, some of the children are better at it than we are. Okay, let me have a quick look at the chat box. Okay, brilliant. So we have someone saying they do some of these activities with their children already. And I think a lot of them, you can actually get your children to make them up with you because then they're using their imagination. We're helping them create independence and learn to do lots of different things themselves. So there's never, I said um, in another session, there's never a right answer. If you find something that your child really enjoys, do it and play with them. And it might be from your point of view, you think, oh, again, but the children love it. And if we go back to the brain development, the more they do it, the more automatic um, that control over their movement becomes. We often have children who struggle to sit still. And some of that is they haven't got that stability. And one of the things that we need them to, to think about is that actually being still is the most complex movement activity there is. And often children who can't sit still um, need more movement, not less. So rather than saying, can you sit still? It should be, right, let's get up, let's have a bit of rough and tumble, jump around, play. Let's get rid of some of this excess energy. Some children, 
And I know sometimes in our houses, we're sort of thinking, oh, don't want to do this. But some children like nothing better than diving off a sofa onto a pile of cushions. It's good fun. It's good for them. As long as they know they have to put the cushions back afterwards. Um, some other activities. Um, how far can you blow? This is a nice activity. If you have a small uh, table tennis ball or maybe a tiny light little car that children might play with. Idea behind this one is they're on their hands and knees on the further over. And you could, you could play this with you or with a brother and sister and you have a line on the floor between them. And the idea is they have to blow a table tennis ball from their side of the line to the other side of the line. Whoever gets it across the other person's line wins. Now the idea behind this, again, you're in that all fours, a tabletop position, we tend to call this, but you're going to go down to blow your table tennis ball. And back up again. So what you can see is we've got a bit of a press up going on here. So what we're doing is building up, again, that shoulder strength to be able to do that. Um, another nice one can be done anywhere with a towel. And all we do is we put the towel on the floor, again, that tabletop position. And the idea is the child has to get from one side of the room to the other while moving themselves on the um, towel. And until you try that, you won't realize how much it actually does pull your tummy muscles and core muscles to be able to do this. Let's have a quick look at chat again. Yeah, and I think this, this one, we have a comment of saying, um, you know, mums can also do them so they can push themselves. And you know, that's one of the most important things that you can do as a parent is your children will love the activities, but they'll love them even more if you join in with them. And actually, like I said, some of these exercises, core stability and things are good for us all to actually be building up that, those strong muscles. So yes, please play and do these activities with your children. It can become a bit of a competition. Lots of different activities to do. Okay, I'm going to move into, back into the presentation just to talk about another area that move, where movement is very important. Okay, one of the other things that's important in movement is called crossing the midline. And crossing the midline, sorry, I'm just gonna come out of this one. If you think about, um, we have an, imag an imaginary line down the middle of our bodies, and this is called the midline. It's really important for us to be looking at how we can learn to cross the midline. Now, crossing the midline comes from movement, but if I just give you a little bit of an example, moving back again. As a baby, you might see babies who pick up a toy in this hand, put it in this hand, and then take it and put it back down in the other hand. So they're picking up like this, doing that, then doing that. You don't see babies doing this because they can't. Now that is crossing the midline. It's something that they develop um, as they, it's a developmental milestone for children, but a very important one. The more children um, make links from one side of the brain to the other, the, the more the crossing the midline helps them make those links from one side of the brain to the other. Now, if they don't do that, well, we'll talk about that in a moment, sorry. So the, the more they cross the midline, the more the links they make from one side to the other. Now, crossing the midline happens by movements that go across the midline. So actually being able to touch my shoulder with the other hand, touching this shoulder, touching that ear. So for example, as an adult, this is probably a lady's example, as an adult, um, if you can't cross the midline, it's very difficult to put an earring in. Um, lots of these movement skills are things that they develop as children, but they are things that they need right through their life. So this isn't about just in the classroom, this is about enabling children 
to function as adults with that movement vocabulary that they need. So things like passing a ball around my body crosses the midline. Passing a ball along a line crosses the midline. Things like at home on the table asking somebody to pass you something or asking a child to pass you something, but asking them to pass it with the, the hand that makes them come across their body. All of those activities help children um, learn to cross the midline. If we then think about, if you are a child and you go to school and you're learning to read, and this is where we start seeing the impact of the movement, how it, what it has on children's academic ability. So if I'm a child and I have a, a, a storybook and I'm learning to read, one of the tools that a teacher will use is finger pointing. So children, as they're reading, will finger point and run their finger underneath the line of print. If children can't cross the midline, it means they find it very difficult to finger point. If their fingers don't cross the midline, their eyes don't cross the midline either. So a child who's learning to read has to turn their head to read one page, turn their head to read the other page. And there's a lot of this going on. So after a while, they get a really, really sore neck. And actually they then think, I don't like this reading, it hurts. It hurts and it makes me tired. So they don't necessarily want to do it. When they start to write at school, it becomes even more difficult and more obvious. And this is important where, as we need teachers to understand this as well. So when children are learning to write, if they can't cross the midline, they can't just sit at a desk and do this, like a lot of us would do, or do this depending on what kind of writing you use. We can't, they can't do that. So what they do is they push their chairs out, they put their books sideways and they lie across their desks and they write up sideways. As a teacher, I've got to say that many times before I knew all and understood all of this, I would say to a child, sit up straight. Actually, they can't sit up straight because they can't cross the midline. So they're not able to do that. So we need to be looking at making sure that they get enough movement opportunities that help them to cross the um, midline. Uh, again, we've talked about some of the passing activities to do that. Um, we could, um, bubbles are a lovely activity. Um, I sometimes use bubbles with children and I'll give them, um, first of all, because bubbles are a really nice activity for children because they, they need to learn to be able to track a moving object. Now they do that with lots of games and physical activities, but it then helps them, once they can track a moving object, it helps them be able to um, track um, writing across a page. So it helps them with their reading. So with bubbles, for example, you might start a child off standing on the spot, maybe even a, cup, a big piece of paper. Ask, ask them to stand on a piece of paper so they have to keep their balance. So they stand on the paper and you blow, first of all, just blow bubbles towards them and ask them to, to, to pop the bubbles, blow them up high, blow them um, close to them. If you think about going back to how we develop our motor skills from the inside out, the bubbles that go closer to them are going to be easier for them to pop. This is where we start being able to challenge all the children. So if they come close, they're easy to pop. If they go further away or high or low, it's more challenging for them to pop them. Once they're doing that quite well, what we could do is actually restrict them to using one hand. So it might be that you say you can only pop the buttons with your right hand, the bubbles with your right hand or your left hand. If they don't know the difference between their right and their left hand, you can get some of those tiny little colored stickers. So you could put a blue on one hand, a green on the other, and say, pop it with the blue hand, pop it with the green hand, and then blow the bubbles onto the opposite side so that the children are forced to move across to be able to pop those buttons. So as I say, bubbles are a really nice one, slow moving, easy to catch. Other ones that are nice, balloons are lovely ones for children who are learning to throw and catch. 
because they take such a long time in the air. A child has plenty of time to be able to think about where they're going to put their hands to be able to catch the balloon. So again, we need activities that build up shoulder stability, core stability. Well, as children learn about their, their bodies, they learn about where their bodies are in space. They learn that when we're, if we have an, a scratch on our, an itch on our back, we, we know where to put our hands because we learn about our bodies. If we're going to um, hit a ball with a tennis racket, we're not watching to check where our hand is all the time. We just know where it is in space. So children are learning that body awareness, knowing where their body is in space and being able to do that, that then helps them when they need to look at maths about estimation of distance, about um, knowing how far, how, far, how far to throw something, how hard to throw something. Um, if children can't move backwards, they find it, the concept of subtraction very difficult. So all this movement links hugely to their academic performance as well. So we can't underestimate the importance of movement for our children. Um, let me just zip back into, uh, I'll just have a look in chat and then we've got that. Okay. We'll come back into sharing the screen. So again, developing from the top down and from the inside out. So anyone with all children who wants to challenge them, further away, the harder it is. Okay, so we think that over the years we have made progress with our children. We look at the kind of um, things that our parents had or our grandparents have, and we think that we've made progress. But what I'd like you to think about is some of our childcare practices, for example. Um, there's a neuroscientist in America who calls this generation of children the container kids. And what he means by that is that actually we put children, children spend more time in um, push chairs or chairs, much more than um, children of past generations did. If I just come out of here one second and show you what I mean. Um, there's a shop in the UK, which I think you probably have in Abu Dhabi as well, called the Early Learning Centre, which has some beautiful things for children. But they also have a chair that is built like a big teddy bear. So if I just show you, this chair, like a teddy bear, arms out, legs out. And what happens, I'll just drop that camera a little bit further so you can see me better. So the baby slots in between the teddy bear's legs and the teddy bear's arms come around it and it, there's a lovely soft cushion for the baby to put its head on. But if we think about what I've been talking, to, talking about with children's development, in this chair, that means that actually the chair that teddy bear's arms are holding the baby up. So the baby has no need to develop that core stability because the chair is doing it for her. The lovely soft cushion for the baby's head means that the baby doesn't have to lift its head because the chair is doing all the work for him. So although it's a beautiful chair and it's very soft and nice and brightly colored, a lot of parents will think, oh, that's my child will be very safe in that. And that's exactly what they will be, safe. However, they won't be developing the skills that we need them to develop. So sitting for long periods of time in chairs, in push chairs, means that they're not developing those physical skills. And one of the best places for a baby is actually on their tummy, on the floor. Not for huge periods of time, but on a blanket, playing on the floor. So they're actually developing those skills. I have a lovely book called um, Retro Baby, and it talks about getting rid of all the new electronic toys um, and actually giving children the kind of toys that people had years ago, the building blocks that they have to manipulate and move around. If you think about um, 
a jigsaw. A child picks up a jigsaw, they have to manipulate it, they have to move it around. If they do a jigsaw on an iPad, the only thing they do is move it around with one finger. So the manipulation skills are massively reduced by not doing that. Okay, let's get back to our screen. Again, any comments, any questions, please put them in the, um, into the, the chat box. Um, again, some of the thing with childcare practices is that we're all busy and the time, sometimes giving children the time to learn to do their buttons or their trousers or their coats when we're rushing to get them out of the house or into school or somewhere else, it's sometimes it's so much easier for us to do it ourselves, but actually we're not doing the children any favors. And it means that sometimes, um, you know, the children aren't ready for school because they've been doing so many, um, so much thing, so many things have been done for them that they need to learn to do themselves. Um, screen time is another important one to think about. Now, I'm not anti screens because I think we do all have to learn um, about technology, but we do have to think about how much time children are spending on screens. Um, there's a lady in the UK called Baroness Susan Greenfield, who's a neuroscientist, and she wrote a book called Mind Change. And in that book, she talks about um, children's brain development. And she talks, as I did earlier on, about children having lots of brain cells, but not many connections as a baby. But then if you look at the brain, ce brain cells of a three-year-old, the, the brain scan, it's just a mass of knots and connections. Most of those connections have been made through movement. Um, and if you think what she says is, for example, if I said to you to go outside now, and if there was a grassy hill, you, would run, you could run down the hill, you would feel the wind in your face, you would feel that dislevel in the ground, you would feel that horrible moment when the top of your body starts going faster than the bottom, and you're going to splat. Um, and what we're doing there is experiencing the world through our five senses. And what she's talking about is that if a child is spending significant amount of time on screen, what they're actually doing is, is experiencing the world through two senses. And she now actually has evidence that children's brain development is being inhibited by um, excessive time on screen. So you know, sometimes we do want children occasionally to be on screens, but I would be thinking very carefully about how much time. Um, and I would probably suggest that under three shouldn't be doing it. Um, and maybe a couple of hours for older children, but not significant time on screen. Okay. Oh, we've lost. Okay. I'm just going to stop my share. For a moment any questions before i just quickly move on to something else do we have any other questions things to go and chat now everybody's been quite talkative up to now so any questions any comments please feel free um, there's no such thing as a silly question just um, ask away if you have anything else If not, I'm going to whiz back to my screen. Um, and just to talk a little bit about senses um, and how they help children's development. So if we think about um, a lot of the time, it's our senses that actually motivate us to move. We're, in, we're curious about something or we smell something and we want to see where it's coming from or we want to touch something. Um, and we have our familiar senses that we're, we're all um, know what they are, sound, touch, taste, smell, sight. But when we come to movement and development, we also have the vestibular sense, and that's about your balance, knowing where you are, um, being able to keep your body right, and proprioception is knowing where parts of your body are. Um, and if we are going to actually help children develop those, um, we need to be using the senses 
in a lot of our different experiences. And sometimes if you have children who have got um, some special needs, sometimes they, they feel a little uncomfortable with their senses. So it might be, if I just whip back to there, it might be that for some children, um, they are very, very sensitive to sound, that um, we might just completely ignore something and, it, and not even notice it, but then some children will be finding the noise in a sports hall overwhelming. It might be that they go into a supermarket and there's bright lights and there's noise and there's smells and there's people walking around and bumping into them and they find that overwhelming. So it's worth working with your children and finding out if they are uncomfortable for any, with any of their senses and um, how you might help them and asking um, questions around, you know, what is it, are there certain colors you don't like or there's certain sounds you don't like. So the more information you have about your child, the better it is. So with this one, it is very much about following your child's interests, um, the things that they enjoy. And it might be that, um, you know, I, I have a young grandson who is four at the moment and he likes dinosaurs and everything we do is about dinosaurs. So when we play and we're moving around, he's a T-Rex and I'm a pterodactyl. Or we go to the park and he's swinging on the park. Um, another fantastic uh, thing to develop your shoulder strength, swinging on monkey bars is brilliant for those sort of activities. But all the time when we are playing in the park, we're not just playing in the park, developing those activities or going on the swing, which helps our vestibular sense. We're playing at dinosaurs because that's what he likes. Um, I'm hoping it might change soon because I'm getting a little bit sick of dinosaurs, but while that's what he enjoys, um, that's what we'll do. Um, respect their reactions. If, for example, you have a child who um, doesn't like their vestibular sense, that, that, that balanced sense being overstimulated, it might be that sitting on a swing or on a roundabout is just way too much for them and they don't want to do it. Now you can introduce them to little um, balance activities. It might be that a little bit of rocking with you, those kind of things. But going on a swing or going on a roundabout might be way too much for them. So it's actually looking at what their reactions are. If they don't like it, don't force it. You can come back to it later and let them explore um, in their own way. And as I say, you work and play and explore with them because the more you do with them, the better it is. This I thought was quite an interesting one to show about how um, digital technology is actually invading the world. That, and there we have a little potty with an um, iPad on it, made by a very um, good toy manufacturer. But again, we're introducing children to an awful lot of technology very early on. Okay, and this is just looking at the kind of thing, um, sort of wrapping up what we've been talking about. Your early experiences do affect the development of the brain architecture. And it does, that is the, the foundation for all future learning behavior and health, and, and health. So if we're thinking about a weak foundation in a house, it's exactly the same as giving children a weak foundation, a weak movement vocabulary. So what we've got to be thinking about is the first years, the first five years are the most important in children's development. And most of that time they spend with their parents. So what can we do to help give our children the best chance possible um, as they are growing up? And just a couple of things to think about there. Okay, so this is where we have some time for question and answer. So please 
um, ask as many questions or share some of the activities that you do with your children already that they particularly enjoy that others might be able to have a go with. Suits for a simple activity that suits for a three-year-old in a pool. Okay, I think some of the things, again, in a pool, um, lots and lots of opportunities. So I think some of the things, so bouncing a child up and down in a pool is a really good one. So that, because that, not only are they getting used to the water, but it, again, it's stimulating that vestibular sense. It's helping with their balance. They more than move around. They can do that. Um, again, with a ball, if you have a ball in a pool that's floating, and get them to be pushing it around their body. So again, we're developing that midline crossing from playing in the pool. Um, a lot of children like the blowing bubbles, so they go down just to their mouths underneath and then blow bubbles. And taking them, if you want to take them, get them used to going underwater, um, especially younger children, maybe even younger than three, when you hold the child up in front of you, if you blow in their face, then they automatically take a deep breath. So if you blow and the child goes, <gasps> and when they do that, you know it's safe to put them under the water because they've just taken a breath and then bring them back up again. So quick blow, then they can go up and down. But again, a ball, any, anything you want to do with them, if you're playing with them, makes a big difference. Okay, any other questions? We have a few minutes left, so anything you, um, you want to ask, you want to comment on. I think for me, the, as I said from the very beginning, the more you can play with your child, um, the more fun they can have, use the books and one of my suggestions might be tonight if you've got um, some picture books um with your younger children have a read through the picture books and we will talk about this in other sessions but have a look through the books and think how can we put some movement into this how can we um put movement into everyday activities actually asking the children to help you put the shopping away is very good because it builds up their strength so they could carry a bag of flour or a bag of rice. Um, obviously something that's well sealed because you don't want them to drop it and then to become a big tidying up project afterwards. But all of those little activities, if you can ask, get children to do them, even um, things like if you go down to a local shop and give, letting them carry the shopping home um, can make a big difference. Because quite often children will, um, come out of school and straight away give the parents their rucksacks or their bags. And actually carrying something that is going to give them a little bit of strength is very helpful for them because they need strength to be able to develop the skills that we were talking about. But from an academic point of view, they need that strength and balance to be able to sit at a desk and be able to listen to the teacher without worrying about having control of their bodies. So any other questions or anything else you'd like me to talk about? We literally have about five minutes left. So if there's anything else you want to know about or anything you would like, um, obviously we've got our new session, our next sessions planned, but if there's anything else that you would like to be included, um, please ask now um, and we can add those in. Okay, one last quick little thing that I'm going to show you, and I think we've sort of touched on to it. Um, battery or free range. In other words, how much freedom do your children get to play? And um, without necessarily huge adult supervision, are they um, always just in front of you playing or just sometimes can they veer away a little bit? I know I did some work 
um, in one of the Emirates recently, and they said that actually some of their children got to play out more than they do in other areas now because some of them lived um, in gated villages, so the children were allowed to go out on their bikes and out with their friends because they all they all knew that they couldn't get out of the village. So it meant that they were doing um, a lot of activities and being more free range children, being out there and learning and playing with their friends. Um, so it's thinking about what opportunities do your children get um, to just have a play and not be constantly under, you know, with an adult. Can I do this? Can I not do this? I think also the gen the, when we were talking about container children, um, the neuroscientist in America called, also called this generation the bubble wrap generation. Bubble wrap generation brought up by helicopter parents because we're always there around them um, saying, please be careful, don't go too high. Um, and I was recently um, in a park near me and there's quite a big um, a dome, I suppose you would call it, made of ropes that children climb up. Um, and my grandson is quite physically active and he was zipping right up to the top. And then there was another little girl who was watching him near the bottom. And I could tell that she was desperate to climb further up, but she was with her grandfather and he was saying all the time, be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful. And actually, if we are constantly that be careful um, voice, then we're actually discouraging children to do that. Okay, I've got another um, glass ball transfer with water. Okay, brilliant. So transferring the, the ball with water using her feet is brilliant because then we've got, again, moving your feet, you've got that core stability is building up and moving it from one container to the other um, is helping coordination. As I said, there's so many different, um, different activities to be able to do there. Okay, so next week, um, we're going to be looking at a lot more activities around movement. So we're going to have um, the different types of movement are locomotion, object control and stability. So we'll be spending our time doing lots and lots of activities um, around those. So it, lots of different ways of moving. So hopping, skipping, jumping and games that we can do to help that. We'll be looking at um, when we mean object control, we might have balls, we might have some bits of fabric. I sometimes use balloons, the inside of a kitchen roll. So if you want to have ready with you, just some bits and pieces that you would have at home, not to go out and buy any special equipment. So, so maybe a paper plate, a balloon, as I say, the inside of a kitchen roll, anything that the children might be able to roll or balance things on, that would be um, really useful too. Um, so we'll be going next week will be lots this week we did the theory about why it's so important but next week it will be lots and lots of just practical activities so you can have fun with your children okay anything else okay thank you very much everyone See you next week.